Hello, it's Martin Curlers here um, from the Archaeology Institute, University of the Highlands and Islands, based in Orkney. And it's a lovely pleasure and privilege uh, to be invited to speak to Orkney Archaeology Society during the Brocktoberfest event, Brocktoberfest 2021. Um, so thank you very much for the invite. And it's really exciting and really interesting to be able to tell you about some of the some of our thoughts on some of the excavation work that I'm involved in right now. Um, I just want to I'm going to share the PowerPoint and then we'll get going. OK, now <laughs> I have what I hope is going to be a rather intriguing title for you today. And the title of my talk is A Haunted House Dealing with the Dead at the End of the Cairns Broch. And hopefully this will become apparent uh, what exactly I'm getting at and what I think might be going on towards the end of the Cairns Broch. But I'll introduce the site um, initially and give you a flavour of what the site's like in case you're not aware of our work at the Cairns. Here's uh, <laughs> here's where we're talking about. Here's the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shetland and we're in Orkney and we're in South Ronaldsay down here in South East South Ronaldsay, a little bay called Winnick Bay um, facing out to the North Sea and our site lies a few hundred metres back from the actual shoreline and at an elevation of about 42 metres above sea level. Here's a few facts about the site. It's a big multi-period site. We've had many seasons of excavation, quite frightening when I contemplate them, although many of them are quite short. In fact, all of them are relatively short. We have undertaken in that time the excavation of, of about 20 Iron Age buildings, from a bit more than that now, actually, by the current reckoning. We've partly or fully excavated uh, 20 buildings. And that has yielded thousands of artifacts, um, thousands and thousands of hand recovered animal bones and thousands and thousands of environmental samples that we've taken during that time. And that's to give us a picture of the environment, the activities and the practices that people are involved in um, 2000 years ago during the Iron Age when we're primarily interested in the period of the site. Um, and uh, also to uh, allow us to have samples of radiocarbon dating and, uh, and more on that in, in uh, short order because it's a very important part of the narrative that I want to convey today. We have uh, a very well preserved set of physical remains, three dimensional upstanding preservation, which allows us to think in three dimensional terms about the architectural spaces that have been preserved. And that's wonderful. That's just such a lovely privileged position to be in to actually deal with this sense of space and the volume of space and the social space um, is one of the things that I want to talk about today. But you can't get better than the kind of three dimensional preservation where you actually have the roof preserved on the upstanding buildings, as we do in the case of some of our subterranean structures, such as this souterrain structure F at the Cairns. This gives you some view, some idea of the, the um, uh, aspect from the site, although that is quite an old photograph now and the trench is much expanded and much more intensively excavated and, and we are much deeper down. But it gives you a nice sense of the landscape and the kind of commanding view that the site had a vantage point across that landscape 2000 years ago. Here's a little image, uh, a little aerial image. Thanks to Bobby Friel for this one um, and his Take the High Road um, uh, activities. And uh, it's a still video in a sense, but um, I'll just play it for you because I think the little figures moving around on it give you a sense of the scale of both the trench and therefore our excavation that we're involved in and the scale of the remains in the in the past, sitting at the heart of it, of course, a massive broch structure, um, some 22 metres in external diameter, so quite a a chunky building, but surrounded by a series of village buildings. Thanks to Hugo Anderson Weinmark at the National Museum of Scotland uh, now these days for this um, photogrammetric uh, model, or rather a still from a photogrammetric model that he produced a few years ago. But you can see the the actual thing on Sketchfab if you if you look it up. And again, just to give you a sense of the the, the substance of the remains that we're talking about and this principle 
broch or structure a that lies at the at the heart of it and here's another view into that and it's both preserved well externally um, and in terms of uh, the depth of the the uh, walls or the height of the walls as well as the internal dynamics of that space the internal uprights the orthostats as we call them and more on those to come because they're very important to the the story i want to tell so I want to focus in on structure A, it's the Brock, it's or sometimes known as a complex Atlantic roundhouse or, an, or a substantial Atlantic roundhouse, massive subsecular structure. About 21 and a half metres in overall diameter, uh, five metre thick walls, um, the internal diameter of the Brock is 11 metres and it stands to over two metres in height in the better preserved sections of it today. Um, but originally it may have been up to five times that height or more based on our reading of the architecture, the scarcement ledges that would have provided upper stories and the intramural staircases, the staircase set within the walls of the building, which clearly are elevating um, uh, people up into higher um, levels again within the structure. So we envisage this as a multi-storey building, quite a high-walled structure, a very substantial and complex piece of architecture and very monumental. And within that landscape setting that I mentioned, this would have been a very impressive building. <laughs> There's not many unimpressive brocks, it has to be said, but this certainly would have been one of those impressive brock structures. Um, Here's a view into that building, that building, as I say, some very nice um, uh, uprights or orthostat partitions that demarcate the space inside the building um, physically and would have been the scene of particular activities and particular sorts of practices that people were engaged in. Um, and in plan view, that looks like this. So we have this very nicely demarcated space. We've termed these different areas, different rooms internally. You have a north room, a west room, south, southeast, and a northeast room, and a central room. And we have a series of passageways leading off from the the internal, uh, sorry, from the entrance passage with a series of passageways leading off that connect up some of these rooms. And that movement we can reconstruct. We're very, very lucky to have such well-preserved, cohesive and coherent layout that allows us to actually be able to um, demonstrate how people would have moved around that building and how they would have occupied space in terms of uh, the, the various relative rooms. So it's wonderful to be able to do that. We can create this kind of reconstruction for how the how space was navigated and negotiated in that sense. And that's all good, but there is a slight downside at the Cairns in terms of the great preservation. There's a slight double edged sword to this, which I'll go into um, just shortly. Um, <clears throat> let's give you a flavour of what's going on um, uh, before we move into the, the main uh, discussion that I want to, to talk about today. So here's the here's the Brock. Let's concentrate on just one room. That's the West Room. This is a, an image of the West Room. And here we can locate it here over on the left hand side, the furthest internal space um, from the from the main entrance in the interior of the Brock. It was a busy room. There's a lot going on in it over time. We think it was the Brock was probably first occupied in the first century BC, although um, we may yet find it's earlier still. We've been able to define the use of, of many of the areas in a series of what we call cycles of activity. I'll show you what I mean by that. So in this West Room, here's the, the primary um, stage of activity as we understand it currently. The pinky area is a hearth. We'll get more definition on that as we continue to excavate this primary stage. Um, but uh, for now, we can identify that central location and some of the setting, uh, stone settings that frame that hearth. It's a big area of uh, substantial paving located over on the northwest side of this west room and then smaller bits of paving dotted around, particularly here. This is where you came in from the other areas. This is where you, you passed over a threshold and connected into the west room. So a series of earthen floors and rake out deposits surrounding the hearth and some really substantial, heavily uh, slabbed uh, areas in certain key locations within that west room. Over time, that gives way slightly 
uh, to this, and this is sort of towards the end of that first cycle, when most of that paved area is just engulfed and smothered in uh, occupation deposits, detritus, soil and materials rotting down, vegetation, all sorts of um, materials from processes uh, of production and of cooking that engulf um, large parts of that west room. The hearth is kind of bursting out and spreading out in this stage and the rake out is kind of meaning that the uh, the area of the hearth is losing some of its definition, but it is still very much the centrepiece of that west room. And over here they've had to put more paving in, more substantial paving in, in this key threshold area as you come into the west room, that remains uh, paved. Then in what we call cycle two, there's a change again, a new hearth slab laid down, um, a whole series of, of substantial slabs and minor slabs and, and earth and uh, soil and material and detritus that's emanating from the hearth activity. Um, and then they go again in cycle three and we have an, another new hearth slab laid down, substantial hearth, flagstone floor is replaced, particularly in that corner again, that persistence and recurrence is, is interesting in terms of what's going on there in terms of their attempts to maintain this sense of really quite heavy slabbed area in that corner. New slabs again within that threshold area as you come into the west room and then um, more hearth material spilling out, rake out and occupation deposits uh, starting to, to uh, fill out. And then towards the end of that cycle three, um, the heart, again, the hearth is losing its identity, as it were, it's spilling out. Uh, there are more hearths, uh, more slabs placed in the entrance area, but generally speaking, more, more detritus, more mess. And that takes us all the way up to the end of the West Room or the end of the occupation of the West Room, when we have a deterioration, if you will, of the formality of the layout, where our slabs are collapsed and, and collapsing over um, some of the upright partitions um, in the West Room, dividing it from the, the, the Northern Room next door. And we see an awful lot more mess and detritus. The hearth is effectively extinguished at this point in time and covered over by other material. And so, my reason for for showing this is 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 that it, we can demonstrate a recurrence and a long duration of attempts to to recur uh, to repeat and uh, reproduce some of the conditions inside that west room of the broch, one of the busiest rooms in the broch, and this is the detritus and the day to day activity over we think many many generations of activity, and as well as the. Um, the structural evidence that we have and the occupational deposits, the, the floor deposits themselves. Um, we also have materials like this, quite mundane and prosaic, but nevertheless important, and particularly when plotted and uh, quantified and qualified in terms of fragment size. These are just frag thousands of fragments of burnt bone. This is just from one particular grid square within that West Room. And this has been the subject of Mandy Daly's dissertation um, in uh, recent months, uh, who's uh, a recent master. Uh, student of ours and uh, so thanks to her for some of this work on the floor deposits and occupation material in the west room and we also have as well as burnt uh, small fragments of uh, bone animal bone almost certainly the residue of cooking process and food and uh, consumption we've also got larger pieces within those uh, floors as well which give us even more of a handle on the types of animals uh, the types of butchery processes and the types of food consumption that are going on inside that West Room. Suffice to say, huge amounts of food production and processing and we think consumption in and around that series of hearths over many generations. And these are uh, uh, bones that are laid down within the successive floor deposits. We've got artifactual material as well, lots of nice bone working like this and stone tools, stone, uh, simple stone tools and spindle whorls, textile production. Uh, these might even be, this object here uh, might be involved in, in some sort of frame for uh, some sort of textile production, uh, loom-like uh, uh, kind of weaving work perhaps. Um, another uh, bone tool over here, piece of antler drilled, um, both socketed and perforated transversely and that may be something like a the handle of a bow drill or something kind of quite relatively complex and uh, sophisticated in terms of tools and little bone scoops like this um, that might have been used for any number of little small scale precise operations and activities. There's also lots of pottery from the Brock. It's just a few examples of some of those, some of that laid out on the table there in that shot, some of the decorated pottery. 
And we do have a particularly large volume in proportion terms of decorated pottery from the inside of the broch relative to, to what we find outside the broch. Um, and I don't want to push that any further than, than that simple statement at this stage, but certainly we've got a lot of decorated vessels. And these decorated vessels may well reflect the fact that um, people are engaged in forms of food consumption and even feasting and hospitality, which involves the presentation of these foodstuffs in quite elaborately decorated containers and vessels. Um, and that may be why we're seeing quite a large volume of decorated pottery from the Broch in particular. So there's a sense of this kind of buzz buzzing, busy social life at work within that Broch interior in the West Room in particular. And in uh, saying that, we also have a range of other items, uh, which we jokingly call bling here. But the serious point to it is that there's a lot of jewellery items, a lot of personal adornment and ornamentation going on. Um, rings of a variety of different types. Um, pins also like this one. Uh, more rings, as you see, this one's a broken spiral ring and this one's a, a, a tiny little ring that might be actually a piercing. Uh, perhaps, or a piece of little, um, if not chain mail, then a chain link perhaps on some kind of elaborate um, brooch or something of that nature. The types of things have been found on other brock sites elsewhere. And continuing the theme of bling, just for a second, lots of beautiful glass beads like this particular one, that's a microscope slide shot of the bead on the left, so beautiful glass bead, recycling Roman glass in the first and second centuries AD. Probably these beads are being produced somewhere on the Scottish mainland, like the wonderful site of Cold Duffel, um, just outside Inverness. That's um, uh, a wonderful site recently excavated that shows that, that demonstrates glass beads being produced from recycled Roman glass objects, vessels and the like. So these are probably imported in an Orcadian context, but nevertheless, very, very interesting in terms of their deposition and their placement and their presence. More glass beads, tiny little ones. Um, that one's an actual Roman one, not an Iron Age style bead, but a Roman style biconical bead. Um, and this one's a, a kind of nice polychromatic bead. And this one's a tiny one, just gives you a sense of the scale of this. Next, a 20 pence piece and a micro slide of it to show the show it in close up. So a beautiful little blue glass bead. We've had a few of those out the brock as well. And this one's a beautiful aqua coloured um, glass toggle fragment, um, which would have been like kind of dumbbell shaped. So you're seeing about uh, kind of half of that object overall. And this would be like a toggle or a dumbbell, almost like the button in a or working like the button in a, a duffel coat almost. So there's plenty of evidence of, of production, of consumption, of people um, in the space working hard and also probably having an interest in social life as well. Um, personal objects are to the fore within that West Room in particular inside the Broch. And there's a great deal of activity going on in there over a, a, a longish period of time, probably as, as much as 200 years that those cycles are taken to, to develop. Here's the internal arrangements inside the Brock again. And I mentioned that there's something that's slightly less happy about the fact that we've got such great um, cohesion and comprehensive, well preserved uprights inside of it. And, you know, while we can reconstruct the movement around that space through the various doors and thresholds connecting up these internal room spaces. Nevertheless, the downside, the slight downside to that is that they are so well partitioned that the stratigraphic deposits across these different rooms or between these rooms are very difficult to relate. It's very difficult to take the context of floor deposits and occupation material in any one of these rooms and relate it directly and phase it and synchronize it to the floor deposits developing in another room. And that would be particularly the case, for instance, in rooms that are well separated. So, for instance, the southeast room over here and say the west room that we've been talking about over here, they're separated by several corridor spaces and other rooms. And it's very difficult to match the stratigraphy and the sequence of what's happening in, say, the southeast room to what's going on in the west room. Radiocarbon dates 
help a little bit and we're able to produce um, a sequence based on those. But radiocarbon dates, of course, are quite broad and wide in their ranges. And though they're scientifically absolute, they have a statistical um, possibility sense about them. You know, they are they are within date ranges of acceptability, acceptable statistical viability. Um, and this is just a slide showing uh, a set of radiocarbon dates for the site um, running through the Brock period and into the post Brock period. Um, so the Brock has this very coherent and intact layout, which, which we've been able to recover the plan and the pattern of, and that's really important, really exciting, and it will help us say so much about how these Brocks were used and utilised, and that will be comparable with other Brocks across Atlantic, Iron Scotland and beyond. But, and here's the radiocarbon dates, um, quite a number of them, over 13 dates that we've applied to deposits and items from the inside of the Brock and just outside the Brock so far. Um, but as I said, the date ranges are quite wide. And what that's telling us overall is that the Brock may have been constructed sometime in the first century BC and is going out of use um, in the mid to late second century or early third century AD is probably what the rate of carbon dates are telling us. We wish we could get closer. We wish we could define this and get, make this tighter. And that's the wish of almost every archaeologist working with complex data from excavations is to constrain and confine and tighten those and sharpen those dates. More on that then to come in just a second, because let's indulge in a bit of science for a moment or two. We're very lucky at the Cairns that we've been able to collaborate with a number of people who've helped us in a whole series of ways um, to scientifically analyse different aspects of the material from the Cairns. I just want to pull out one because it really does allow us to go very much further with our understanding of the chronology and the sequence and the activities uh, towards the end of the Brock. Um, here's a picture of Dr. Vicky Sable from West Carolina University, um, itself based in the state of North Carolina. And together with uh, Dr. Brennan McLeod Fraser from St. Mary's University, Halifax in Nova Scotia, we've been able to collaborate over the whalebone from the site in particular. Uh, Vicky's a whalebone specialist and Brenna's a, a whale specialist and a, and a whale conservation and genetic specialist. And we've been able to look at um, a collaboration with them, which some of you will probably know about, in which we've looked at the DNA um, from uh, a whole variety of whalebone items from the Cairn site. Um, and this one in particular, here's a, an image of a fin whale, um, the second largest whale in uh, in the world um, and the fastest whale in the world and uh, we've the genetic shows us that there's a great deal of fin whale bone present on site and that includes um, unfused epiphyses that's the the backbone discs the vertebral discs uh, rib uh, fragments um, scapula fragments and uh, vertebral drums uh, themselves utilized in a variety of different ways Here's a, a shot of a whalebone um, vertebra being lifted during excavation from the rubble fill of the Brock at the Cairns. And we found quite a number of these items dotted across the Cairns. Um, this particular one happens to be a humpback whale rather than fin whale, but there's a connection as hopefully you'll see in a moment. And working with Vicky and with Brenna, we've been able to plot out in quite astonishing levels of specificity the species of the whales across uh, the site that we've analysed. So we've analysed about 30, or they analysed about 30 uh, different uh, whale items, whale bones, and these are the different species present. And we've got <clears throat> in, uh, we've got a variety here, sperm whale, grey whale, North Atlantic, uh, right whale, minke whale, humpback whale and fin whale, and the blue is fin whale in particular, that fast and very large species that I mentioned already. And this is quite astonishing stuff to be able to actually analyse and get a sort of checklist and inventory of whale species that are being utilised on site through time is really fascinating in itself. And one of the interesting things, a lot of these whales are the large, particularly large whales, um, and that may or may not have a connection to the status of the site at the Cairns because, it, you know, one wonders how ancient communities who had um, the, the kind of landfall 
uh, boon of, of whales stranding on their beaches and, and maybe sometimes hunting some of the smaller species, but many of these species are probably stranded locally or nearby. And one does wonder how that operated in the past, how negotiations occurred, what relationships were in place, what protocols were there for these whales to be, you know, spread, uh, dispersed and how the, the whale meat and the whale bone that's clearly much prized was distributed amongst communities and it's interesting therefore to see the cairns uh, gaining quite a large share of large whale species in particular. Now the fascinating absolutely incredible thing about this is that we can go further and I think some of you will know about this as well. So Brenner was able to examine two key haplotype regions of the genome of each whale bone amongst the fin whale group that were previously identified by DNA. And she was then able, therefore, to fingerprint one individual. So the vast majority of the fin whale bone that we see pre present at the site is from a single individual fin whale who was not yet absolutely mature, but was nevertheless quite a whopper in terms of size, um, with unfused epiphyseal uh, ends in some cases, and in other parts of the vertebrae of the animal, the, the backbone was fused. So it was clearly a, a kind of adolescent in the process of moving towards adulthood, it would seem. Now we can call this the fin whale event, and so I will <laughs> across the, the presentation, because what we're looking at here, I think very strongly, is uh, uh, the, the fin whale bones, the identified, the, the genetically fingerprinted fin whale individual, allows us to connect up deposits and contacts across the site, both horizontally and vertically present, both within and outside the broch, and allows us to close down and, and, and think about the relationship of some of these contexts, which as I've already said, are sometimes divorced and shuttered from each other by virtue of the wonderful architectural preservation, but which constrains the stratigraphic relationships, as I've suggested, and that pertains both inside the room, inside the broch rather, between the rooms, and also pertains between what's going on inside the broch and what's going on outside the broch, you know, by virtue of that five metre thick wall curtain that is the broch wall. So it's very difficult otherwise um, to, to get a handle on those stratigraphic relationships. And here at the Cairns, I think because of the boon, the rather, uh, uh, rather unexpected, wonderful boon of the genetic uh, work and what it's telling us about the presence of a single individual allows us to actually constrain these dates. And so what we've done is we've played around with Bayesian statistics and effectively what that involves is, is constraining the range of the radiocarbon dates by virtue of other known stratigraphic or other um, evidences. And we think this is probably the first time that anyone's been able to actually use DNA evidence to constrain stratigraphy. It's been attempted in terms of human remains, um, looking at the sequence and the relationship of, of cemetery populations of prehistoric human remains and thinking about the statistical likelihood of, of human remains uh, and their relationship sequentially through time um, to constrain uh, site stratigraphy. But we don't think this has ever actually been achieved on a settlement site um, or attempted on a settlement site. And what this is allowing us to do is statistically constrain, um, as you can see here, we're, we're able to bracket the fin whale event and the radiocarbon dates that we have for a variety of deposits involved in that fin whale event, and therefore group these together and tell the statistical model that these represent a date, uh, an event that's very close in time, whereas previously um, there wasn't that information uh, in detail to apply to the radiocarbon dating. So it allows us to constrain the dates and it gives us this. It gives us this remarkable clarity uh, and uh, precision for the end point of the Brock. So at 95.4% probability, our Bayesian model, our statistical model is telling us that the Brock ended sometime between AD 191 and 233. And at a 68.3% probability, our Broch in the model is, is ending between AD 204 and AD 221. So it's very, very much constraining the, the end of the, of the Broch for us. It's given us much, much more precision. And it's suggesting it's at the very, very end of the second century AD and, and per, or perhaps just into the early part of the third century AD. Here's the constrained radiocarbon dates for uh, 
one of the radiocarbon dates that represents the very end of the Brock for us. And so we can sharpen that radiocarbon date. And um, what it does for us is it gives us a model date that's, that gives us a 42 year um, range of date uh, for the end of the Brock, whereas the unmodeled um, previously non-genetically um, enhanced uh, sense of radiocarbon dating uh, was a 156 year span. So it really is hugely enhancing the date range for the end of our Brock. And it's that end of the Brock that I want to concentrate on because what it allows us to do is appreciate just how intensive the process at the end of the Brock was, the process of abandoning and slighting and ending the Brock, decommissioning that Brock. We can see based on the associated materials that relate to the, 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 the deposits that the fin whale event has a relationship to, we can see just how intensive that process actually was. So I want to move from the kind of the scientific bit of the talk now to the anthropological part of the talk, if you will, in that sense. Now, I don't in this, I, I don't want to um, refer to any particular um, non-Western traditional societies and examples of their practices and activities um, to bolster what I'm saying, because I don't want to introduce a kind of cross-cultural element that might be kind of inappropriate to the Iron Age of Orkney 2000 years ago. But suffice to say, I suppose some of the ideas involved in this are, are, are quite heavily influenced by the ways in which we, we see through um, many decades now of, of anthropology and ethnographic fieldwork the very important relationship that exists between traditional communities and their ancestors and their conception of their ancestors and their understanding of the activities of ancestors and of the dead and how they interact with the living community and continue to have an impact. And so what I want to do now is, is sort of examine this intensity of the end process of the Brock that I've mentioned just previously. And, and describe that a little bit and then come up with some possibilities for what, what explains the kind of strangeness and the weirdness of what we see. So here's some deposition at the end of the Brock. We've already highlighted the fin wheel and in this, the again, the, the blue circle, so you can see the spread of them. And the wonderful thing is, of course, what this allows us to do is to suggest that the fin wheel, the genetically fingerprinted fin wheel that's present in the southeast room is also, well, we know it's the same individual that's in some of the intramural chambers set within the Brock wall. We know it's present also in context within the south room. We know it's present in context within the west room. And we know it's present in context in the north room. So remarkably, it's, we're able to equate some of these deposits. Now, there could be some curation going on. There could be some of this whalebone was held on to for a, a slightly longer period of time and utilised in different ways before being deposited. But nevertheless, I think probably we're looking at, you know, a, a much um, a closer in time appreciation of the of the deposits than we previously were able to do. Now, if you're sharp eyed, you'll also see both in terms of the key here, as well as in the symbols employed on the on the map, on the plan, you'll be able to see the reference to ABGs. These are associated bone groups. These are series of animal bone groups that are all deposited as articulated or semi articulated individuals um, across uh, some of the same deposits that the fin whale is present in. So we can see a whole variety of these, and we'll talk about them more in, in just a minute, but we can see a whole variety of animal bone groups deposited at the close of the broch, along with or spread amongst uh, the fin whale. Well. So there's sheep and otter, there's seal, there's deer and cattle, multiple ABGs in some cases with, with several animals present in one grouping, um, one deposit. There's uh, the fin whale, of course, um, and there's also things like uh, artifactual materials, and I mentioned these already, and we'll talk about them a tiny bit more shortly, but some of these saddle querns um, that Mandy Daly was able to successfully plot out and appreciate across the surface of the Brock. So this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the intensity of deposition that I suggest is going on at the end of the Cairns Brock, just as they're beginning to prepare for filling it in and backfilling it in and decommissioning that Brock. Now all along, since we started excavation, we've encountered things like this, and they seem quite 
subtle, quite mundane, a bit prosaic um, in terms of the content of these little caches and deposits, but they are nevertheless kind of intriguing and interesting. So all the way through the rubble infill of the Brock, as we excavated it, we would find little groups. This is a nice little one because you've got a little, some several cobbles, little rounded beach-worn cobbles. No sign, no sign of any working of them or utilised any sense that they were utilised as tools. So a little tiny little group of shells, if you can spot that, and some semi-articulated animal bone here as well, and a little a little bundle of bone and a little cache of cobbles. And these are these are the kinds of things that are found quite in quite a lot of Brock excavations and other Iron Age houses in Scotland, and found within infill contexts. And often there's a bit of scratching of the head and a bit of puzzlement and a kind of lack of well, what do we do with this and what do we say about it? And, and in earlier generations of excavation, we strongly suspect these things weren't even recovered or noted, of course, and not written about and not discussed. Uh, here's another little one. Um, this time you've got, again, in the rubble infill of the Brock, you've got a couple of cobbles. There's a little cobble over here, but there's another. There's a couple grouped here with a little piece of animal bone. And this animal bone, it's here on the it's on the, the, the left here, and it's a, a little uh, tool. It's a little bone tool. It's a prong or a fork, uh, just a really simple piece of carved bone um, and placed between the two cobbles to give a, a kind of interesting uh, kind of uh, arrangement there. Um, but again, relatively mundane. And as we excavated more in those early seasons, removing more of the rubble infill and you can you can see the brock wall emerging here and not rights etc appearing and emerging and and here's more of these little cobbles present within it um and here's in one of the mural chambers the, the so-called yellow cell because it was lined with clay when we freshly excavated it and here in the center and in close up here more fragments of of whalebone these are some of the whale bones that became uh, eventually became genetically fingerprinted. We know our fin whale from this chamber. Here's a close up, quite a large piece. This is a transverse process from the side of one of the vertebrae of that fin whale. And you can see a chalk mark here and you can see other chalk marks uh, within the body of the, the porous tissue, the porous bone tissue, the interior of the, the whale bone where they've been chopping and disarticulating and, and disaggregating and breaking up the bone. So that fin whale bone is, is present amongst that rubble, those sets of rubble contacts along with those bone bundles and cobble caches that I've mentioned. And we also have uh, things like this as we further down, lower into the rubble again, these animal bone grips that I mentioned. This one's a cattle vertebra, um, little bundle of them here, right next to this upright, tucked between the upright and, uh, and the inner wall face of the, the brock. And you can see some of these little vertebral discs here. Here it is cleaned up, that same uh, bundle of bones. That's the, the articulated um, uh, juvenile cattle spine. Um, or a portion of it. Um, and these animal bone groups, they, they, they do appear to have been cooked. They appear to have been portions of food. They appear in many cases to have been butchered and processed. There are butchery marks on many of these animal bone groups that we find. And these are sections or joints of meat which seem to have been deposited uh, rather than consumed or perhaps a bit consumed and then deposited in the ground, but in such a condition that there was sufficient sinew and soft tissue still adhering to them to keep them in an articulated or semi-articulated or loosely articulated condition as they went into the ground. And we've got loads of these ABGs, loads of these associated bone groups from across the Brock, across all periods, and, and they seem to accompany major changes, points of transition in the sequence of the site. We'll always find these animal bone groups, and we've radiocarbon dated quite a lot of them as well, because there's great evidence for, for phasing uh, of the changes and the transitions across the site. So here's just some examples. Here's a cat um, with much more complete uh, specimen in this uh, case than this cat. Pig. Of course, big rib cages, vertebrae, neck joints, um, foot joints in this particular animal bone group. Um, and then here, the backbone of a, a sheep or a goat as well. Now, these are being placed, as I say, uh, at the end of the broch. They're in the rubble, but there is also in the upper occupation deposits, the last gasp of activity inside the broch. We've got um, examples of them like this one, which is the juvenile uh, vertebra from a, a cattle. And this is placed on directly on top of a slab 
that caps the entry into the underground structure underneath the broch in the northeast room of the broch. And you can see under excavation here, it's sitting directly on the slab. It's in its articulated state. Here's the portion of the animal here. So it's the sort of neck portion of the, the vertebra, cervical vertebra. And <clears throat> that seems to be laid out and placed very intentionally or very, uh, very definitively on top of the stone that's been used to seal off and to cap the entry into the so-called well or underground chamber, more on which uh, just in sh just short order. We also have a lot of wild animals present in these animal bone groups. This is seal. Uh, we've got several seal shoulders. Um, so this is the vertebra and uh, humerus, etc., related to the, the flipper portions effectively of the seal. Um, these probably are also food items um, and they're deposited in areas within uh, the broch, including the, the southeast room and the, and the corridor space of the, this uh, leading into the south and southeast rooms. Here's some more um, pieces from various animal bone groups. Again, more seal, uh, juvenile pigs, suckling pig and swan, the collection of swan bones here in the bottom right corner here. Um, so the, the, the wing portions of the, of the swan um, uh, placed as one of the animal bone groups as well. So this is all a bit odd, a bit strange, a bit interesting. Um, it's seen on other Iron Age sites, so it's not completely alien to us, but the intensity and the volume of this material is quite, is quite amazing across the Brock interior. And of course, allied to our enhanced sharpened radiocarbon dating, and our Bayesian modeling of the fin whale event, allows us to see these are all part of a very elaborate process at the end of the broch. Now, <laughs> I want to deal with the, the structural and the architectural components of this process now. So that's some of the materials that are found, uh, animal bone that are found during the, the and stone tool or stone um, object, object items that are found during that infilling and ending process. But let's look at some of the processes as, in terms of how they affected the architecture and the layout of the building. And I've called this, disorientating the dead, question mark, false floors, pseudo orthostats and shifting hearths. So inside the broch, as we were excavating it, we, um, as we removed some of that rubble in the early seasons, we would find some of this, um, some of the, these uprights starting to emerge and we would think, ah, fantastic, we're starting to see evidence for the way in which the broch was laid out and demarcated along the lines that I've already demonstrated in some of the earlier slides. But as we continue to excavate, some of these orthostats turned out to be not quite what they'd first appeared. Quite a number of them, particularly in the south room and in the southeast uh, room, turned out to be sitting set upright and making contact with the inner wall face of the broch in a way that would be concomitant or intelligible in terms of them being divided, dividers laying out space within the broch. But many of them were just laid on the rubble itself. So they had to have been set up as they began to introduce the rubble into the interior of the broch to end the broch. Um, so these orthostats weren't what they appeared at all. They weren't part of that regular series of that cohesive layout that I've shown earlier on in the talk. What they are instead is something just happening at the very end of the process of backfilling and ending the broch. And that's really quite odd because you know, the question, the first question would be, why would you do that? Why would you set up a set of divisions in tight, inside the broch just at the very point when you're giving up on it and ending it and decommissioning it? And we sort of puzzled over this and we thought to ourselves, well, maybe, just maybe there are sort of different groups working inside the broch to end it. And maybe they're setting up orthostats, these upright slabs, to sort of demarcate their workspace in terms of the, the work of ending the broch. But it wasn't entirely satisfactory in some ways, that explanation. And there's, there remains mystery over it. It's very odd uh, to contemplate what's going on there. Um, and here's some more examples. It's again the south, east, south uh, east room and up here in the, in the division between the west room and uh, the, uh, sorry, the North Room and the Northeast Room. Again, a, a sort of fake orthostat, um, pseudo orthostat, as I've called them, set up um, among some of the existing orthostats um, just at the end of the broch. So something quite interesting going on there. And what I'm 
what I would suggest is, is perhaps happening as, as, as part of that process of ending the broch. These author stats are being set up to reconfigure and reorganise some of the sense of the logic of the layout of the space. And now why they would do that at the very end is probably, you're probably already moving ahead and thinking about this in terms of, you know, my title and some of the general thoughts that I've already given. Let's um, let's look again at the, the stratigraphy of the site. This is for those of you that aren't jobbing professional archaeologists. This is um, this is a very summarised Harris matrix. This is a way that we have of representing the sequence of deposits uh, at work on an archaeological site. And um, these are some of the many whalebone fragments, the fin whalebone fragments that we're able to um, now identify thanks to the work of Vicky and Brenna. Uh, to a single individual through their DNA. And we have them present in both the South Room and the South East Room. So the orangey one is the South East Room and the green, sorry, uh, South Room and the green are deposits from the South East Room. And what we're able to do is convert some of the Harris matrix sequence to bring it together to see the thin wheel event and to intervene in the Harris matrix to introduce the the uh, the connection and the association. And one of the really fascinating things about that is that we actually started to re recognize that some of the thin wheel is actually uh, sealed from one room to the next uh, room and within a single room as well and is is capped by a series of of um, uh, additional layers of slabs and flagstones that are introduced into areas like the southeast room uh, during the end of the broch. And so we have um, fragments of whalebone capped by that flagstone element that's introduced and elements of that same thin whale uh, present immediately above in the deposits above that capping. So this has shown us how quickly, how swift that process of infilling has been, but how complex it was as well, in the sense that they're actually introducing not just rubble, higgledy piggledy, but sometimes pausing and introducing little platforms of flagstone, roughly set flagstone surfaces, uh, which prior to the genetic ID uh, work, we couldn't really know how long in time it had been uh, the period of time over which these um, events were occurring and that maybe these were secondary occupations inside the Brock, but it doesn't look like that at all based on either the radiocarbon dating, but particularly the, the modelling of those radiocarbon dates from the DNA work. And so we can do this, we can compare what, what were previously separated Harris matrices within individual rooms within the Brock. So here's a summary matrix for the southeast room in the green here, and then a summary matrix for the west room in the blue. And we're able to bring these together and the starred uh, deposits, each of these is a stratigraphic unit or context. And the ones with stars with the orange stars appended to them are the thin wheel uh, uh, deposits or some of the thin wheel deposits in these two rooms. Uh, and therefore we're able to sort of bring these Harris matrices, we're not, not exactly merge them, we wouldn't want to absolutely merge them together, but we can certainly sh shuffle them and shift them up and down to actually um, allow us to see when deposits are, are, are being formed uh, relative to each of those rooms. And one of the interesting things, as I mentioned already, is, is the presence of that DNA fingerprinted fin wheel from a variety of different contexts above and below um, uh, kind of flag uh, surfaces, etc., and across the rooms. And even in this case, refitting. And these are epiphyseal discs. So these are the unfused discs, very large pieces of whalebone from the backbone of the fin whale. And these are uh, possibly um, used as lids. Uh, Jackie Mulville, um, very well known uh, faunal remains specialist based in Cardiff University, has suggested that in the Iron Age of, of Atlantic Scotland, that many of these epiphyseal discs are being used as lids for containers, perhaps uh, for uh, whalebone vessels themselves. And interestingly, we had some fragments like this piece of fin whale of the fin whale here was associated with this uh, quite bashed around, but nevertheless uh, uh, a vessel, a whalebone vessel carved from the backbone of a humpback whale. So here we're actually able to associate uh, some of the, the DNA fin whale with other uh, whale objects and uh, from other animals uh, at that time. So this piece of disc, this fragment of disc was associated with this whalebone vessel. Maybe 
uh, actually maybe actually validating the idea that these discs were sometimes used as lids or associated with uh, vessels. And these refit other fragments of the fin whale, uh, these other fragments of, of disc, of vertebral disc, found in other parts of the broch, um, both above and below some of the oops, some of the flagstone floors or pseudo floors um, that we found late in the life of the of the broch itself. And here's another close up of one of these kind of quite roughly set areas of, of uh, flagstone edge set with stones um, sitting over the rubble and also itself sealed by rubble um, during the process of decommissioning the broch. Whalebone vessels fragments underneath it and above it uh, that refitted to show how how uh, how swift in time this process was, and this is the kind of thing that's found. Here's a photograph from the excavations at Crosskirk Broch, where Horace Fairhurst, the excavator there, encountered things like this halfway up the rubble infill of the Broch, and suggested, or could only suggest, that perhaps these are used as platforms to help the people ending the Broch. Um, access and stabilise portions of the rubble whilst they're filling in um, areas of the rubble above. It seems like quite a lot of work to go to to lay an actual formal flag surface or edge set in the case of the one from the Cairns here in the in the southeast room. Um, and we can now see through that um, enhanced data and we can see how, how quickly um, that activity, that flag surface, rough surface or structured rubble as we've sometimes called it, we can see how quickly and how fleeting that was and it really does seem to be part parcel of the process of ending the broch and it caps fragments of these whale bones which is a really interesting thing. These, these whale bone discs as artefacts are being fragmented and dispersed in different locations and sometimes sealed and separated from each other using quite heavy duty um, techniques like laying down um, flag, rough flag surfaces. So it's all very interesting. Um, and then in field archaeology, I think if we reflect on the orthostats and the divisions for a second, we're very used to thinking about these as helping us to, to demarcate the space within prehistoric buildings in terms of how they govern human movement. But maybe I think what we also need to think a bit more about as well is how they guided movement and help people know where they were within uh, what must have often been fairly dark places and spaces. So orthostats as well as dividing space within a dark interior lit by a hearth here and there and lit by the odd uh, quite subdued lamp would still have been quite dark and difficult places to navigate during the life of the Brock. And so maybe we can suggest that orthostats were also seen as a guiding element within brocks that people would be touching them, that they would glance against them, that they would put their hand there and they would move around the brock and know where they were within the familiarity of that layout scheme vis-a-vis -vis these upright partitions. So as well as governing space, they could be seen to guide space in that sense is, is the kind of argument I'd like to make. That would be one way in which the community at the Cairns and other brock sites would, would think of these orthostats and how they would use them in that kind of tacit way of guiding themselves around the interior. Um, here are these uh, Harris matrices that I mentioned before, one for the summaries for the West Room and for the South East Room, and how we can therefore connect these rooms uh, together by dint of the appearance of the, the, the uh, genetically fingerprinted fin wheel, and we can equate some of these sequences. And that's really, really quite an advance in terms of our own stratigraphy and our chronology and phasing on site. It's really wonderful to be able to do that. Um, let's uh, let's also look peer into another aspect of the, the fin whale bones, which is really interesting, which is that we've got a scenario where um, uh, once the, the infill of the broch begins, they appear to be laying out portions of these fin whale uh, items, um, here another epiphyseal disc, up against the wall faces and snug against some of the, 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 the uprights, in this case a real upright to all intents and purposes. Um, and then as they then sub, uh, submerge that in more rubble and as they continue the process of filling in the interior, they then uh, will pause and then they'll place uh, another piece of whalebone so on the right hand side here, these two images 
are a piece of whalebone, part of the fin whale that's tucked between the orthostat and a gap between that and the inner wall face, low down just as they're beginning to, to end the broch. And then probably not that long after, but when um, there's more rubble in the interior, immediately above that first piece of whalebone, but separated by you know, about half a foot of rubble, here's another piece of whalebone, a superficial disc that goes in again in the very same spot, vertically speaking, one juxtaposed upon the other, but separated by quite a large amount of rubble. So that's kind of interesting in terms of the kind of repetition and recurrence of the, of the locational uh, nature of where they're placing whale bones. They're placing them up against walls, they're placing them up against uprights, they're placing the animal bone groups and the whale bone against some of these pseudo orthostats as well as some of the real ones. And they're separating now these items using both horizontal means um, in terms of uh, flagstone elements that they introduced to cap and to seal and divide one portion of the rubble infill from another or one part of the sequence from another and also horizontally they're, they're, they're doing this in terms of um, the placement of uh, fragments of whalebone in different rooms but from the same epiphyseal disc or the same portion of the whale. Now as well as, as that process of change within the broch of, of uh, introducing those pseudo orthostats they're also there are also many of these uprights as we excavated them have toppled, have collapsed. Many, many of these we've found during excavation. And here's just a few examples of them um, where we've in the photograph, we've actually posed the uprights back on their upright position, rejoining, refitting uh, the stump in the ground left behind. Uh, so you can see where they've actually collapsed. This one's lying prone and its stump is right next to it. And here's another one being refitted um, for a photograph. And here's another example of a, another, one of the pseudo orthostats this time actually removed from its rubble bedded context. And here's some more of these in the central area. You can see they're opening up like a leaf. You can see that upright folding over. This one's collapsed. This one's collapsed. And here, and uh, here's another one. You can see uh the uh the, here again you can see these folded out and and uh, lie flat and if we look at um the pattern of this across the brock interior you can see uh, there's a whole load of these spread around so these are just some of the, the 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 positions of uprights that have been toppled that have collapsed and the usual way of explaining these is that perhaps these have been knocked over during the process of you know the, the building aging and they've fallen over and been left or that perhaps in the process of backfilling the, the broch, maybe the, the rubble has hit some of these orthostats and damaged them and knocked them over. But from what we've seen in terms of the fairly fragile objects, like the whalebone objects and the animal bone groups that are both in the rubble infill and in the upper occupation deposits and which are engulfed in or submerged in rubble, it looks like the rubble infill process is a much more careful affair than just simply standing on the wall head of the brock and chucking in large bits of stone. It looks like there's a much more methodical basis to the way in which the rubble is infilling the brock. And therefore, I would suggest that it's much more likely that these toppled orthostats are being deliberately snapped off, kicked over, pushed over in certain portions, certain locations within the brock. There's a much more deliberate and intentional process than merely the accidental byproduct of rubble cascading into that brock and knocking them over. So that's something else for us to sort of hold on to. We've got we've got uh, artificial uprights, pseudo orthostats introduced into the interior, and we've got some of the real orthostats that have been there for generations are broken off, snapped off and pushed over. So there's a kind of remodeling I would argue of the interior of that space. Old orthostats rubbed out, new ones introduced. There's a resetting and a reconfiguration just at the very end of the brock. Why you would do that when a brock is, a, is about to be put out of use, um, who you would be doing that for is is the key to the, all of this, I think, in terms of the, the, the uh, where we're going with this in, in this talk today.
Here's some of the artifactual material, just to change of pace for a second. Lots of pottery spreads laid out again on the uppermost occupation deposits. Um, so just before the end of the broth, just before rubble is placed in. With pottery spreads like this one, where upright stones were actually brought down and smashed on top of a whole pottery vessel that had lain um, with its base uh, pointing upwards. In other words, the vessel was upturned, it was inverted. And then a, a big slab from one of these uh, upright, dislodged uprights was brought down and smashed it in situ. Um, and here you can see the base of that pot still adhering to the underside of the, of the slab when we lifted the slab up. There's also more mundane objects, again, things like these caches of shells. We'd lift up the odd toppled slab and there would be a little group of shells um, concentrated, clustered just underneath the slab, literally just under. In this shot, you can literally see where we've just lifted the slab uh, and and uh, and uh, there's the shell group just underneath it. So there's this business of little, little materials, little caches of materials just being uh, uh, sealed and capped by some of these uh, toppled uprights. So that's some of the richness of that process. Here's some of the here's some of the um, uh, the rubble infill uh, being excavated, just to give you a sense of the volume of that and the substance of it within the brock itself. Just various shots of us excavating that material in different parts of the brock interior in some of the earlier seasons of excavation. And um, as if though that, that strange transformation and that strange reconfiguration at the end of the brock wasn't enough, there's also things like this going on. So the hearths uh, or, or full, um, areas of burning or late hearths have been set up in spaces where they previously weren't located. So in the case of the northeast room here, there's a, we know from the excavation of that room that there was never any hearth within that room across the life of the broch, you know, perhaps for hundreds of years uh, of occupation. And then at the very end of the broch, just in the final gasp of activity, they do indeed set up a very rough um, paved um, or a flagged area. Uh, it's heat affected and fire cracked, and it was surrounded by heat affected peat ash um, and stained, uh, stained the soils around it. And it was quite a bit of a blaze. And it was positioned so close up against the, the inner wall face of the brock that it actually stained and blackened and cracked um, the brock uh, wall adjacent to that area of, of heating. Um, so these, and, and this, we've seen this in a, a number of different rooms in the broch, where the hearths at the very end of the broch are not what, not where they were uh, through most of the life of the structure. It's as if they're repositioning the hearths as well. So they're repositioning orthostats and reconfiguring the layout of the space. And they're also repositioning hearths into areas that previously didn't have a hearth. And in a near suicidal way um, for the building, that's to say, uh, for the, the long term life of the building is its capacity is reduced arguably by um, the fact that these some of these uh, late fire settings are placed up against the walls and are uh, damaging the walls. And here's some more examples of it again. Here's the burnt material uh, on the on the base. And you can see it's engulfed in this section. You can see it's engulfed by the rubble infill of the brock. Here's the brock wall. And again, you can see the reddening and the staining of the, the portion of the brock wall adjacent to it. And in this close up here, you can see the red stained fire cracked uh, wall adjacent to that portion of burning. So what I think I'd like to suggest is, is that there's domicide at work here, that the house is being killed uh, in an anthropological sense, I suppose, and the house is being brought down, it's ending, it's being dealt with in a particularly intensive manner and it's been filled in with rubble. But before that rubble goes in, there's a whole series of deposits that are laid out on the uppermost floors and then deposits that connect and link to them are being deposited in the rubble. And before that rubble goes in, there's also a wholesale reconfiguration of phony orthostats and ending real ones and replacing hearths with new ones at the very end that just are not where they were during the life of the building. Um, and you get a sense of that kind of entombment of the house as in the terms of it being engulfed in rubble and this shot of a before and after early in the excavation on the right and later in the excavation on the left there to show the, the difference in the and the kind of wholesale infilling of the building. And here you see again um, a montage of a number of different shots from the from the uh, south inner wall face of the brock here to the north inner wall face of the brock there and the rubble uh, 
uh, the thickness of the rubble in between. Very swift process and rich and full of materials. Now, not every brock has a whole series of deposits in the infill rubble. So, for instance, here's the wonderful excavations at Clachtall Brock in uh, in uh, Assent in the north west mainland of Scotland, recently excavated by AOC Archaeology and Historic Assent. And uh, in this particular case, it would appear the brock burnt down as part of an accidental event, probably, I think, is the, the lead interpretation by the folks at AOC Archaeology. Um, and in the rubble, in the hundreds of tons of rubble that came out of the interior of that brock, I don't think there was a single artefact, um, hardly an object at all. And that shows a very different sort of process. I'm certainly not arguing that every brock ended in the way that the Cairns did, but certainly the difference is really palpable and interesting. And at the Cairns, we have this very strong sense of a structured abandonment happening at the end of the brock. Um, there are other objects in the process as well. This is a, a cache of items that were found just outside the north side of the brock as the as the end point uh, is, is reached. Um, and this is a wonderful set of 12 long handled weaving combs or textile combs that were deposited in a pottery vessel and placed in the ground outside the brock. So a group of objects like this, and as the title of this slide implies, I'm suggesting perhaps some of these caches of items are being deposited in appeasement of not the living at all, but the dead and the spirits, the ancestors, maybe even we're right to call them in some sense ghosts because they continue to have an impact on the living. Here's that set of long handle weaving combs again, a bit of close up, some of them, half of them decorated very elaborately and beautifully. A fine gift indeed for anyone living or dead. Saddle querns, I mentioned already, lots of these both in the uppermost occupation deposits in the Brock and also in the rubble infill. And here's some more shots of some of those ones from the Brock and from just outside the Brock. And again, we go to Mandy Daly's dissertation, undergraduate dissertation. And I think Mandy's actually talking about these querns from the Cairns and others sites uh, for the Brocktoberfest event. Um, so I won't steal her thunder, but just simply to point out, look at the uh, the green uh, querns here. Uh, the green ones are querns that were deposited during the life of the Broch, um, and the blue ones are deposited at the end of the Broch. And you can see quite a spatial distinction. You can see how these querns are placed in areas that during the, the working life of the brock were not apparently the scene of too much quern activity. They weren't the locations where um, substances and materials like foodstuffs were being ground down, um, but instead in the uppermost occupation deposits or on top of them and in the rubble, we have querns that are placed in the north and in the central portion of the brock in contrast to where they're generally populated in the interior during the life of the building. So there's a, again a strange inversion, a strange uh, uh, difference in terms of uh, the placement of items during the life of the brock and the placement of items afterwards. Lots of um, lots of pottery as well. Um, I mentioned some of the pottery spreads already, so I won't go into them in huge detail, but again, more pottery spreads found in locations, for instance, in the north room of the Brock, which don't seem to have been particularly full of, of uh, activities relating to ceramic containers during the life of the Brock. So we've got the death of the, this house, and I'll call that Brock a house. Um, I'll stick my neck out there and say it was a house, although the question mark over what kind of house is the age old um, crusade within archaeology or Iron Age Scottish studies, Scottish Iron Age studies. But we have this sense of the house being, as I've suggested, being killed and being put out of use. And outside the Brock, this very elaborate deposit, continuing the theme of, of objects and materials deliberately um, uh, placed as many of you will know about this wonderful whalebone vessel again itself part of that genetically fingerprinted fin whale two red deer antlers propped against it and a range of items found inside including the fragments of three neonatal lambs it's wedged in with this large saddle quern another quern positioning it up against the outside of the brock wall just north of the brock entrance and inside of it of course this um, jawbone this is a, a fragment of the jawbone it was near enough complete in reality um, 
which is currently the subject of DNA examination itself, but I'm afraid I don't have any of the results of that yet, but we'll get there hopefully. So we have that jaw uh, present uh, in that whalebone vessel. One of the ancestors themselves, I would argue, the radiocarbon dated to a point in time that's very consistent with the end of the broch. So we might well imagine that this individual who this jaw belonged to in their youth perhaps had actually been directly associated with the broch as one of its household members. And that a fragment of that individual was then placed in one of these closing deposits um, outside the broch itself. I mentioned the well already, the underground structure beneath the, the broch, and here it is indeed. Uh, the opening into it and looking down it during excavation and that sort of muddy siltiness down there. And from that, we produced this wonderful wooden bowl, of course. We excavated this. Uh, most people will know about it. It's uh, it's about to come back to Orkney, actually. It's um, almost finished its conservation and it's about to come back to Orkney, which is great. Um, fairly soon and probably be on display uh, soon as well for people to have a look at it. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful object. It was it was repaired multiple times using metal rivets and um, staples and the like. Here's a lovely drawing of it. It's been at AOC uh, down in Edinburgh for conservation, so thanks to them. Here you can see the beautiful line drawing and you can see some of the metal repair uh, repair areas on the bowl. And, been, and, and we now know from residue analysis that that bowl contained a dairy product when it was placed in the well, um, possibly milk, uh, or perhaps butter or cheese. And one can well imagine perhaps that this bowl would actually is a milking bowl perhaps and had been used um, in that way uh, on the day that the bowl was deposited in the well. And then the, the, the bowl containing that dairy produce was then placed into the well upright. Again, I would suggest another, another gift, a gift for the dead. Beneath that bowl as we excavated it, we also found cut human hair um, and this is um, off being analysed at the minute as well and I can't tell you too much about it therefore but what we can say is that there's at least two individuals present here and the hair is cut at both ends and it represents deliberately cut hair and, and again getting a bit anthropological for a minute when we see hair in the cultural content of lots of traditional societies hair like nails are considered to be very private things and very precious things and things that are not lightly um, shed and when hair has to be cut or finger or toenails have to be cut these are parts of the body that can still have efficacy in relation to um, uh, the rest of the organism the rest of the person who shed these things these substances and so these are precious things and following that kind of anthropological sensibility I would suggest that um, that this hair placed is part and parcel of this very intensive process of ending the brock itself a very intentional act so let's summarise the process a little bit. We've got human hair and a heavily repaired bowl with its milk product placed at the base of the well during the abandonment of the broch. Um, and then the well itself is capped with the, the fragment of a, or portion of a spine of a juvenile cattle, one of the ABGs. A whole series of, of animal bone groups or associated bone groups are placed across the floor of the broch. Outside the broch, we've got the fin whale vessel with a human jaw and uh, uh, three neonatal lambs placed and the red deer antlers propped against it. We've got, uh, and that's part, we now know from the genetics that it's part of that fin whale and part of that fin, fin whale event, as we've termed it. There are other bone elements um, of the fin whale uh, broken up and dispersed, including what may have been artifactual materials, uh, the uh, epiphyses, the, the vertebral discs. Um, that are broken and fragmented and placed around different portions of the interior of the broch. There are caches of pottery and querns placed in the upper floors and in uh, both the west and the north room uh, in areas that were not previously known for that kind of volume of material, that type of material in any volume. Lots of the author stats are pushed over uh, across different parts of the, the broch interior, including the inner entrance passage and in the west room of the interior and if we continue this on. Um, the upper parts of the brock are beginning to be dismantled then in swift order and rubble is introduced to infill the brock interior. We then have some of these pseudo-orthostats set up 
um, within uh, the, the lower portions of the rubble set up right in the way that I've described. Uh, we then got querns placed in some of the upper portions of the rubble. And then more of the fin whale bones are then going into some of the, the, the rapidly uh, filling Brock interior um, in what I would call that structured rubble. And some of these are separated vertically from other component parts of the same thin whale um, above and below um, flag rafts and uh, uh, some of the rubble portions. There are more querns and more animal bone groups and caches of material um, going into the infill of the, the brock. Uh, and rubble placed on the outside of the brock as well, particularly around the entrance and sealing that amazing uh, fin whale vessel with its human jawbone and the neonatal lambs. And then we have things like the caches of combs being placed on the outside of the brock <coughs> uh, in that pottery vessel in the rubble there. So there's quite <coughs> an astonishing intensive process at work. And we can now say that it's all happening in very, very short order in a very, very um, short period of time indeed. So what does this tell us about the Iron Age? Now, <laughs> I've jokingly called this slide Iron Age Ghostbusters. Um, and and uh, there is a joke involved in that, obviously. But what's, what, is, what seriously can we uh, gain from this? Well, what I'm suggesting really is that <clears throat> this whole process has been about confusing and reordering the space. We've got phony or orthostats and uprights. We've got or some of the real orthostats are broken down and, and pu pushed down. We've got um, gifts of whalebone items and artifacts and materials placed uh, um, inside the broch in particular locations. Uh, and these are separated and broken and fragmented across the interior and blocked from each other. Um, and who are these gifts for? Well, I would suggest that they are for the ancestors. I would strongly suggest that what we're seeing here is a process that's all about respect for um, and awareness of the efficacy of, of people of the past and of that past household. And we can well imagine that the ending of that broch would have been an astonishingly um, momentous activity. Uh, and the generation that oversaw the end of the brock must have thought twice and thrice, I would have thought, before actually doing it. And so this it would have been uppermost in their minds, perhaps, that they were ending something that had been a symbol of power within that landscape and had been part of the, the cultural order within Iron Age, South East, South Ronaldty for perhaps hundreds of years up to that point. So this would not be an under, a lightly undertaken activity. This would have been, I would argue, impregnated with all sorts of thoughts and processes and activities. And the intensive end process, I would argue, is a reflection of that. And that what we're seeing here is an understanding on the part of Iron Age communities that the dead retain their agency, that they continue to have an impact, that they can exert influence. And that this, you know, we might call these a body of ancestors who are not entirely gone, but continue to have an influence. Um, are they to be feared? Are they revered and respected? Are they appeased? Um, arguably, they are. Um, maybe all of those things. And the structured abandonment of the Brock perhaps reflects that process of recognising uh, and respecting. But on the same hand, at the same time, perhaps trying to obscure things for that body of ancestors. You know, maybe we're talking about maybe some of this fragmentation and this reconfiguration of the layout is about stopping that ancestral um, body of people from actually coming back and exerting influence beyond the backfilled remains of the Brock. What I'm arguing is that the treatment of the Brock at the end is about keeping the ancestors in their place, the realm of the dead, the realm of what's gone before, the realm of what's now passing into the past, the Brock mound itself. And perhaps they are envisaging the reconfiguration of the Brock as a, as a scheme for obscuring the habituated um, practices of moving around that Brock that the ancestors would have been you know, very, very comfortable with. They're breaking down the internal layout. They're also gifting objects, artifacts and materials and, and food groups 
within that rubble and in the upper flow deposits and sealed and capped by a variety of different means so that these gifts can only be appreciated and only can be reunited, if you will, in the realm of the dead. These physically separated and fragmented to such an extent that they can't be reconstituted in the here and the now, but only in only in the, in the afterlife, as it were, only in the hereafter. So again, it's binding the past and binding arguably that body of ancestors into the structure of the the brock as it now exists as a as a mound as a, a set of ancestral an ancestral pile if you will of uh, of ended materials and remains so the community what we're also learning here is that the community can take action they have a they have ritual as an efficacious methodology for coping with uh, and negotiating with the dead and it reminds us that of the importance of gifts and gifting in Iron Age society, which is probably the major mechanism whereby their economy actually operates as a, as a culturally or socially embedded economy involved in the exchange of items and the setting up of agreements and uh, allegiances and, and uh, extending alliances through gift and gift exchange. And what we're seeing here, what I'm arguing is that extends also to the ancestors, that the, the ancestors also can receive gifts and they can be negotiated with. And this in general reminds us of the deep transactional and negotiatory nature of Iron Age society in Iron Age Scotland. So I'll leave it there for now. And the last thing to do is just simply to thank all of the above or all of the, all of those who appear on the slide and particularly given the, the context of this um, talk uh, to uh, Vicky Sable and Brenna McLeod Fraser again for the amazing G DNA and whalebone work that's allowed us to spot the intensity of this end process at work within the broch. So that's been fantastic um, and has really kickstarted the narrative that we're talking about or I've been talking about in this talk tonight. I'd like to thank all those other people as well. And then also, and last by no means, uh, the landowners, Charlie and Yvonne Nicholson and their family for their enduring patience and hospitality and allowing us to, to um, get all this rich material for um, what was going on in the Iron Age 2000 years ago at the site um, in the first place. So thanks to all of them and thank you as well. And I look forward to seeing more of the rest of Brocktoberfest and the wonderful presentations that people have been producing and, and will continue to produce over the Brocktoberfest period. So for now though, however, I'll bid you adieu and thank you again. And thanks again to Brocktoberfest and to Orkney Archaeology Society for allowing me to, uh, to, um, uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you about, about the, uh, about the, um, work at the Cairns. So thanks everyone. Thank you indeed. Bye then. Cheers. Take care.